Civilized nations kill with sanctions and proxy armies. Notes from the Edge of the Narrative Matrix. Pouring more weapons into Ukraine is not how you save lives. You save lives by negotiating a ceasefire. Pouring more weapons into Ukraine is how you create a long and expensive military quagmire for Russia at the cost of many thousands of lives to advance U.S. strategic interests while making a vast fortune for the arms industry. Issuing a guarantee that you would never add a nation to NATO who you don't plan on adding anyway is a no-brainer when the alternative is mass military butchery. I mean, unless your goal was to provoke mass military butchery. If the Kremlin wanted to kill large numbers of people, it should have done so with starvation sanctions and proxy militias, like a civilized government. Fashion has moved on since the early 2000s, you savages. You're not allowed to talk about the known U.S., NATO, and Ukraine actions, which experts have been warning for years would lead us to where we're at. You're only allowed to say Putin attacked Ukraine completely unprovoked, in a vacuum, solely because he is evil and hates freedom. Only talking about the guilt of the invader and not the things that were done to provoke that invasion is exactly what I'd want people to be doing if I had just provoked an invasion. Believe it or not, it's actually always completely legitimate to criticize the actions of the most powerful empire that has ever existed especially when those actions clearly paved the way to a war. The fact that Western media cover Ukraine in a wildly different way from U.S.-led wars is actually immensely important and points to a problem that urgently needs attention. Anyone who takes issue with that should shut the fuck up and stop interrupting adult conversations. Literally every single time I say NATO powers paved the way to the Ukraine invasion, I get some liberal claiming that it's like asking what a rape victim was wearing. No, actually, victim blaming a rape survivor is not at all like criticizing the most powerful and deadly power structure in the world. Liberals have been bleeding this line ad nauseum for days, and it's about the most obnoxious and most shit-lib thing you could possibly come up with. Empire apologists always try to distort power dynamics to make it seem like they're the brave up-punchers sticking up for the little guy. It's tiny Ukraine against the big bad Russia, not Russia against a globe-dominating empire of which Ukraine is just one member state. It's the brave freedom fighters of Syria versus Assad, not Assad against a planetary unipolar hegemon using proxy forces to affect regime change. It's Israel against the big, strong Muslim nations which surround it, not an entire empire, of which Israel is just one member state, picking on far weaker powers, etc. For years, anti-imperialists have been calling for detente and warning that all this Cold War brinkmanship with Russia could lead to hot war. Now hot war is here as a direct result of refusing to pursue detente, and they're trying to act like we're the assholes. Going to be real fun when the consensus that it's fine for government-tied Silicon Valley corporations to censor online speech in the fight against misinformation moves from targeting COVID skeptics to targeting people who disagree with mainstream Cold War narratives about Russia. Nazis in Ukraine, Russian propaganda. U.S.-backed coup in 2014. Russian propaganda. Donbass provocations? Russian propaganda. U.S. and allies armed terrorists in Syria? Russian propaganda. Mass media is propaganda? Russian propaganda. The government's not your friend? Russian propaganda. And there's a tweet by Senator Mark Warner. I'm concerned about Russian disinformation spreading online, so today I wrote to the CEOs of major tech companies to ask them to restrict the spread of Russian propaganda. There you go. The solution to a crisis that was created by brinkmanship is not more brinkmanship. The solution to a crisis that was created by brinkmanship is detente. 
saying the U.S. government is still a far worse offender in the mass military slaughter department than Russia will be met with hysterical shrieking and the rending of garments now. But it's still indisputably true, and if you disagree with it, it's because you're propagandized. That the U.S. is the most murderous government in today's world is just an easily quantifiable fact. Putin will have to work very, very hard to catch up to those numbers. This is important to note, not because of some genocidal dick-measuring contest, but because it points to what a healthy attitude toward U.S. military butchery would look like through eyes untinted by propaganda manipulation. Theoretically, the actual U.S. and NATO military decision-makers know imposing a no-fly zone over Kyiv would be insane, since it's a one-way ticket to another world war, probably a very fast and radioactive one. But the fact that so much of the official U.S. political media class has been calling for one discredits it forever. They sincerely don't seem to understand what it is that would be stopping the Russian planes from flying under such a scenario. They think it's like a rule you make, and then the Russians go, Oh, shucks, I wanted to fly there, but it's against the rules now. Obviously, anyone who had anything whatsoever to do with supporting the Iraq invasion should shut the whole entire fuck up about Ukraine for all eternity. Don't let people act like Iraq is some distant memory. It happened 19 years ago. The Simpsons stopped making good episodes longer ago than that. It just happened. The consequences are still unfolding. The occupation is still ongoing and they're still using these same old tricks. Hollywood teaches us that heroism looks like an individual stopping a bank robbery or leaving a criminal tied up outside the police station so that we don't realize that real heroism looks like a collective rising up against our plutocratic rulers and creating a healthy world.